And uh, thank you for the organizers for putting together this very nice program and uh, including me here in this very high profile program. So um, I'm honored to be part of this. And um, I realized that also the previous speakers have made it much easier for me to give this talk. So thank you for preparing this. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Um, and um, so, oops, yeah. So um, we, um, yeah, whenever I say I talk about extremes, I should specify what I mean by this. So this talk is about, um, how is this? I just wonder. I think this is the wrong uh, slide set, but uh, don't worry. I think it's, it's okay because <laughs> um, I can adapt to this. So I, I made a few changes actually to, to the slides, so, um, but I called them both slide ceremony, so don't worry. So, um, so I need to say what I mean by uh, this. Is, I should also, what also wanted to emphasize this is joint work with uh, Sebastian Engelke and uh, Yevgenis Ivanovs. And um, so it's um, been great to work with them. So, and um, so first of all, let's um, have a reminder uh, about some of the things that have been said already. Um, in statistical practice in extremes, um, there's often this paradigm of either looking at block maxima or at threshold exceedances. Um, and uh, Thomas also said there's some mathematical elegance here and the mathematical elegance is uh, in a way that uh, you can link these um, uh, approaches often, um, at least in the IID setting, uh, that happens often. Um, for instance, there are limit theorems that tell you that uh, uh, when you have a max stable limit, this is equivalent to have a threshold stable limit. And um, something that there are many different equivalent characterizations of this. Um, so when we for instance, uh, you can also reformulate this uh, in terms of point processes, or if you prefer to work with regular variation. Um, there are different equivalent characterizations, and they're quite much scattered across the literature, I think. And sometimes very hard to find a reference which puts it all together. So I saw that I, uh, I emphasize one reference that I quite like. This is uh, Dombri Ribaté statistical interface. Um, so, where they have accumulated quite a lot of these uh, characterizations together and extend this also to different kind of Pareto processes. Um, so, um, for me, this is, has been very helpful to uh, reflect on this. Um, and uh, before I continue, I would also like to point out something. Um, so, I, without giving too much details here, um, I'd like to say that these uh, there is a measure in the background coming up, which is known under different names. Um, I often say exponent measure, others might prefer Levy measure, or others might prefer the name uh, measure of regular variation. Um, so there are different uh, notions for this measure. But uh, when you look at a multivariate extreme value distribution, you can write it at least after standardization uh, as an exponent, uh, exponential function of and then you have a measure, and um, you don't need to worry about the details how to write right now here. But um, so there is this measure uh, lambda coming up that can help you formulate this distribution. And um, so in the threshold stable limit, you can write the limit distribution with the same measure, essentially. Um, so you can use this in order to define the measure. And depending on the conditioning event, uh, this will take different forms. Here is a condition on the maximum, so I need to take out uh, this L shape. Um, yeah, this, uh, I need to uh, take out this box onto one. But um, so there could be other conditioning events too. But you can formulate these limits with this exponent measure in the background. And um, so this also appears, I think, in the maybe the most elegant way to formulate is a point process, depends on taste perhaps, but uh, there's this point process limit that converge to a Poisson point process if you take your observations, normalize them accordingly, and also normalize the time, then you will converge to Lebesgue times this, um, uh, this uh, measure. So this measure somehow links all of these approaches. And so I thought, let's look at this measure a little bit more detailed. So it is a measure. And if we work with these limiting objects, we get some forms of stability. And this stability transitions into a homogeneity property for this measure. And this causes this measure to explode. 
at the origin. At the origin itself, the mass is zero, but um, the measure explodes as you go to zero. Only if you go away from zero, the measure will be locally finite. Actually, if you take a set uh, that is bounded away from zero, if you evaluate, it's going to be finite. And um, so there are different interpretations. You can also, such measures do not only appear in extremes. So there are much wider contexts in which these kind of measures appear. So uh, you can interpret it, for instance, as a Levy measure with respect to the max operation, um, or you can um, look at other operations. So if you work with Levy processes, you will most of the time work with uh, plus instead of max. Uh, such measures appear there too. And um, you can also uh, think of regular variation. You don't need to work only with the upper or cent. You can go in different directions, work with different cones. Um, you, you will have similar measures appearing there too. And um, everything I'm going to say in this talk is, um, is something that, uh, that is not necessarily restricted to exponent measures. Actually, um, everything that I'm going to define now also applies to measures that explode at the origin. So if you have your favorite measure um, here from other contexts, um, so you can take them. Too. Um, well, not quite. Let's, let's, uh, uh, th this was supposed to be my more motivational slide, but I think uh, Johan did it so beautifully that I can't say add much to it. Um, so um, maybe what I should say is um, the approach um, of this talk is more a top-down approach again, which you probably won't like so much, but it's uh, maybe something that where we can find a fruitful bottom-up, top-down uh, uh, reconcile, reconcile these things again. Um, so um, the, the upshot is that many of these multivariate extremes models, um, they do not have a lot of structural insight. So we have, for instance, these low dimensional uh, parametric models, they are often useful in that case. Um, if we go to higher dimensions, and the conference is here about high dimensions, um, we, we have um, much less uh, insight. And um, so the um, so modeling with just a space of measures is uh, is also really not not very appropriate or very meaningful. And so this uh, brings us to um, yeah, I had adapted, for instance, right hand side, so <laughs> to include your work better. So I realized that. Um, and um, so the. Uh, the idea is to have meaningful sparsity structures in, uh, in extremes, not just some sparsity structures, but sparsity structures that we can interpret. And um, so most of the time um, that spars when sparsity structures are useful is either when we can decompose a signal maybe into independent components or if into orthogonal components, that's mathematically what helps us to interpret processes, or um, uh, uh, conditional independence. Um, and uh, so this talk is only about this conditional independence side. So um, here is a brief history how the journey has been for me. So very biased view on how conditional independence um, graphical models have been looked at uh, in the literature so far in the last decade. There's quite a lot of activity. Um, so we start with uh, Johan revised uh, some sort of impossibility theorem that uh, Janis and I discovered that is not very meaningful to include conditional independence directly into these multivariate extreme value distributions. And um, so instead, something that one can do is something that Claudia Kittelberg and Nadine Gesiebel started. Um, they looked at a structural max linear directed acyclic graphs. And um, basically the theorem that Janis and I proved was that you have to do it this way in order to have meaningful um, uh, conditional independence relations in these multivariate extreme distributions. And the alternative approach um, is not to look at this maxima side, but to go to the threshold side. And a lot more has been disc um, discovered in terms of structure, meanwhile. Um, and Johan started already to uh, teach us uh, a few things about this. Um, there was this uh, conference, um, the, the last meeting that I took part of in the pandemic was uh, the Royal Statistical Society before lockdown came in February 2020. 
where um, Sebastian Engelke presented his work um, uh, that he did with Adrian Hitz on threshold uh, stable models and how to incorporate conditional independence relations there and how to do graphical modeling there. And there's been a lot of, um, well, bottom uh, up approaches uh, pursued by Johan, and we heard about this uh, this morning, um, which is uh, yeah, very nice, and I can start from here. Let's review again first um, this Max Linear approach that was pursued uh, by Claudia and Nadine. Um, so they take, go directly and define a directed acyclic graph and uh, define these structural equations based on on this set of structure. So you have already the nodes and, um, and the edges and weights of the edges, and then you can define directly uh, these structural equations that give you the um, um, yeah, um, max linear model. And uh, this has various links to tropical geometry that they also exploit, also for statistical inference. And um, what I would like to point out is that these models are quite discrete. So there is, um, this causes the exponent measure to live on rays through the origin. So these, these models are very, well, um, I'm sure they have the virtues, but there is this restriction that you have to live with the fact that these models are quite discrete in a way. And on the other side, these threshold stable models, um, the way it has, the story has been started is that you have almost the opposite. You always need densities, which is good if you look at condition independence, that's usually what you want to have, for, uh, helps you with the modeling. Um, so um, this threshold approach needs relatively smooth models in a way. And um, this causes uh, the graphs that arise from these uh, threshold models to be connected. So you cannot have, for instance, disconnected components. This is something that was previously excluded from, from the modeling framework. So we got a little bit in a discussion in our uh, 2020 February meeting, and um, this um, yeah, could be partially resolved. And, but this is how this work uh, with Sebastian and Yevgeny started. You know. So now our motivating question was, can we maybe take a step back? You remember there's the maxima and the threshold approach. And what links them is this exponent measure that appears in both. Can we maybe take a step back and define conditional independence directly on the exponent measure? And can we somehow bridge these approaches? So is, is it possible somehow? And um, so a little bit of background. So graphical models, how do you define them? So the backbone of this is uh, the concept of um, conditional independence. And um, here is a slide, here is something that I learned from the book of Lauritzen. Um, so uh, if you have not yet been exposed to this uh, graphical modeling community, you can uh, uh, take the book of Lauritzen, for instance, and look up um, that there are quite a lot of different Markov properties um, that you can uh, that, uh, define graphical models, um, which can be in different applications, different models will be meaningful to you. And um, so I don't want you to read the entire slide, but maybe just to introduce some notation. Um, so if I write uh, X subset A, that means that I refer to the uh, indices that lie in the subset A of, of a certain index set. And again, I think this is meanwhile standard notation here that we write these subvectors in this way. And I will often write instead, um, instead of referring to the actual probabilistic underlying objects, I will write directly um, conditional independence in terms of this index set. And um, so if, we, if our index set are the vertices of a graph, you can think, for instance, of a random variable attached to each node. And, um, then uh, uh, the structure of a graph gives you um, meaning to certain relations. So for instance, you can speak about neighbors um, or if it's directed about descendants, parents, children. And um, these Markov properties here, they're all formulated in terms of these uh, notions that you can get from a graph. So you can talk about separation, about adjacence, and all of these concepts. And these Markov properties 
Um, let's just pick the first one, for instance, you can have the undirected pairwise Markov property. This means um, your probability distribution on the index set um, uh, satisfies the pairwise um, uh, undirected Markov property if for any known adjacent pair you have this kind of conditional independence relation. Uh, alpha is independent from beta given the rest of the nodes in the, in the graph for any node non-adjacent uh, pair alpha beta. And um, so Johan introduced us today to the global undirected property. Okay, so uh, we need to, in order to define graphical models, we need to understand first um, what is conditional independence um, with respect to uh, the um, uh, exponent measure or, a, or exploding measure lambda. And um, so what we would like to define is this here, A independent B given C, uh, based on the exponent measure. And uh, so we look at the partition ABC of the index set. And uh, we take a measure that satisfies a few of these properties that I stated <coughs> at the beginning. Okay, and now it's not directly obvious what to do, because this measure somehow, this can be infinite, so we do not have a probability distribution that underlies this measure somehow, and um, and it's uh, yeah, so it's not not straightforward. And what do we usually do if it's not so straightforward? We try to trace it back to something uh, that we know is straightforward. For instance, you can look at test sets. So why not look at those areas uh, where the measure uh, can be uh, used in order to define a probability distribution and use these as test sets. And this is exactly what we do. So we take any product form set um, that, um, that is bounded away from zero, so we get a finite measure, and which is charged, so which has a positive measure. And um, so, and we uh, say that conditional independence with respect to lambda holds, um, whenever, for such a situation, every charged product form set away from the origin um, satisfies um, actually this probabilistic uh, conditional independence that we know already from the literature, that's fair enough. And um, so every feasible product restriction of lambda results in classical conditional independence. That's what we're going to test. And um, okay, one can do this. And one can also ask, is this meaningful? And um, so the good thing, the first good news is this, um, it turns out that this recovers the notion that Engelke and Hitz uh, defined in their JRSSB paper. So um, this is definitely included here. And um, so this is, uh, in their case, the measure is homogeneous. Um, but it turns out you also don't need homogeneity in order to have this uh, have a meaningful notion. And um, so here's a little bit of assumptions and notation. Unfortunately, the work can easily get quite technical, so we need to take care of marginal models, for instance. Um, so something that I didn't tell you with the definition at the beginning is I formulated it for a petition. Um, but we also need to take care, for instance, of the cases where the sets A, B, and C do not form a partition, but they are only a subset um, of the original index set. And so it it's can get quite index set heavy in that sense. Um, so let's just uh, look at, so, and we often need the marginal measure um, and restricted measure. And something where we also need to be careful is um, what happens if you uh, change uh, these operations. First take a marginal measure, then a restricted measure, and uh, then again a restricted and then marginal. So one needs to be quite careful with these things. So this is maybe also why it takes us so long to get the preprint ready. So, um, so um, and um, something that we need is uh, something, um, uh, it took us a while to find out which kind of explosion conditions uh, we need. Um, so we, we um, can certainly work with all the homogeneous measures uh, that explode at the origin. Uh, they're totally fine and they satisfy all our explosion conditions. 
But if you want to go a little bit more general, um, you need to have some notions of explosion satisfied um, that I formulate here. But um, I think you don't need to absorb them for now. Just say, OK, most, most of the usual cases that you encounter are, are fine. Um, and when we have this complicated definition, for instance, if you define something by test sets, you can ask yourself, maybe can I reduce the test class a bit? That's quite a lot, all the product form sets. Um, and uh, what's quite convenient is, um, yes, you can uh, reduce the test set quite significantly. It's entirely sufficient to, to have only this family checked here. All the um, sets where you take just one slice, basically, out of your RD and make a little, tiny little bit, you, you increase it by epsilon, an epsilon stripe uh, out in one direction, and just take all of these sets as test sets. That's entirely sufficient. Uh, requires some checking, uh, but it can all be done. It's, quite, it's relatively straightforward. And um, you can even reduce it further. You only need to take those slices in the conditioning set and have one extra condition to be checked. And uh, this extra condition is um, when you are in the conditioning set equal to zero, um, you need to check that you have independence of A and B with respect to the re reduced measure. And this is something that's quite annoying to carry around with you. So um, all the next conditions that I'm going to present will have this condition on top. So you always have to check something and this, something else and this. And uh, this is a bit, uh, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So for instance, something that you would hope for is density factorization somehow. Can you, if this measure lambda has a density, you can ask yourself, um, can I characterize um, this uh, conditional independence in terms of densities? And the answer is, uh, yes, almost. So it's, um, you have to check this uh, density factorization, but on the right space. And then in addition, so where the yc is not equal to zero c, but in addition, you carry around this, this extra condition. And similar, if you want to go for kernels, um, you have almost the same thing. The notion that you're used to, but on the right space. <clears throat> and in addition, uh, this condition. Um, how we're going time-wise. So it's, I don't want to keep you from lunch. So, uh, 15 minutes. Ah, good. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, so something um, independence. OK. So we have to carry around this independence um, relation all the time. And so uh, we also uh, need to check what, what does independence actually mean for this uh, notion of conditional independence. So it's good to have this independence notion included. That's exactly what we were aiming for at the beginning, because that's the thing that was missing in the Engelke Hitz uh, paper. So independence was uh, not included. And um, so the good news is um, this is a notion of independence that we are uh, usually also already quite used to in extremes. Um, so A and B are independent with respect to this measure, uh, if we understand something about the support of the measure. So for instance, let's have a look at this left-hand side here. So we have here this red plane and the, and the axis here. And if the measure lambda is concentrated exactly on the red and blue part here, that what, what we get is the set one, two is independent of the set three. Or um, it gets more complicated if we consider, for instance, uh, uh, this situation here. So imagine we have this blue plane. I don't know. Can you see it's blue? So it's, uh, and this is red. And so if the measure is concentrated here on um, this red and blue plane that intersect each other in the two axes, and something that we can conclude is, OK, one is independent from three with respect to this measure. So in this case, one and three do not form a partition of one, two, three, but are just sub, sub. So, um, and uh, I thought to get some intuition behind this. Um, so the first time I tried to prove this, um, I thought, okay, 
let's use the homogeneity property and you get quite easily a contradiction. Um, but it also works in the case um, when your measure is not homogeneous. And I thought I'd like to show you the arguments. So we're uh, in a mathematical monastery. So I thought maybe let's include some proof and uh, use these beautiful blackboards here. So um, let's, let's do the proof for this. So let's see um, this independence characterization. Let's make our life simpler and just look at two dimensions. And let's also just take the upper author. And so the, the argument is essentially the same. And a um, little bit of notation. So these kind of sets uh, where YA is larger than epsilon or RA epsilon. And here um, where uh, I'm uh, bigger than epsilon here, RB epsilon. And um, let's do first the direction from the right hand side to the left hand side. This is what's always true. You don't even need explosion. But um, OK, let's assume that the measure lambda is just concentrated here on the axis. And this is where our measure lambda lives. And now let's think again, what are our test sets? Our test sets are the ones um, exactly those RAB. Um, uh, R epsilon or R B epsilon. So let's take this test set. Everything where we're larger, where we're bounded away from this axis. And what is the measure restricted to this test set becoming? Well, we only need to check this bit here. And this is obviously a product measure. Yeah, so delta zero in this direction and then can do whatever it wants here. And the same for the other direction. So if you take the test set, everything that's here, again, this is a product measure. Um, so, or this becomes a product measure. So we can quite easily check that this satisfies our conditional independence definition. Um, so um, let's, let's say that's done. And uh, let's go for the other direction. And this is where we need the explosion. Um, so let's assume that uh, there exists a delta such that we have a positive mass in this delta. And um, then on top of that, okay, once we have found our delta, um, let's pick an epsilon which is a little bit smaller than this. And now uh, for our test set, well, let's just, let's take a random variable y, which is distributed according to the measure lambda, but restricted here to, to this area. Okay, so we take lambda according to the law of this R A epsilon. And um, let's look at the probability that, um, well, that the Y A is larger than delta Y B is larger than delta. And if we just take the definition of that, that's just, um, well, we always normalize with uh, epsilon because this is uh, where the random variable lives. And then, okay, then we have this intersection here. Lambda of um, R A delta intersected R B delta, fine. And then on the other side, uh, if we assume now this um, condition, uh, this independence here, this gives us that for every such choice, this should be decomposed. So this is where we use the definition. Uh, Ya larger than delta, Yb larger than delta. Okay. And now we can rewrite this again in terms of the definition. So this is the same as, okay, we always normalize. Okay, and here this becomes lambda of uh, R A delta. And here it's R B delta, but we also have to intersect this R A epsilon. Okay, um, and let's just, see what happens. We have 
made this calculation, but let's take just this part and this part and forget about how we did the calculation. So we now accept that this is equal to this, and we see that there is this positive value here by which we normalize. And um, now if we look at the left-hand side here, this only depends on delta, it's a positive number. Again, positive number depending on delta. But if we now let epsilon go to zero, which we can do, we just need to cho choose it smaller than delta. So we can let epsilon go to zero. And this term here explodes. This is bounded by the measure of, oops, lambda missing, by the measure of lambda b delta. And this one here explodes. And so we arrive at a contradiction. Um, so our assumption must have been wrong. And um, we can conclude that we cannot find mass here in this space. And this is the same argument also in the general case. So this is just for two dimensions, but it's easy uh, to extend this. Okay, um, so I'm almost, time's almost up. Um, so just let me say that there's also a modified density characterization. If we modify it slightly, um, we can actually uh, get rid of this extra condition where I said it's, it's just not such a nice extra condition to carry around. But um, this is uh, it's possible if you have um, the correct, um, this lambda has a density with respect to a measure where you have, um, what's important is you need to have a positive mass at zero with, for the measure with respect to which you have a density for the lambda. Um, okay, and um, something that the uh, graphical modeling community cares about are um, a set of axioms, say, um, that are known as semi-graphoid properties. And um, this is something that, this is actually that kept us so long from finishing this work, because we were battling with this contact contraction condition quite a lot. So, we tried to have these semi-graphoid properties satisfied, and one, two, and three are really easy. And this um, L4 property, this requires this assumption A1. And the reason why we need it is roughly the argument that I just showed you. We need this explosion kind of uh, um, behavior for the measure in order to uh, verify the contraction condition. But um, OK, so condition independence. Well, yes, we have a definition, it's meaningful, we can prove certain things about it. Can we go now to graphical models? Well, there's still quite a lot of work to be done. <laughs> but um, we're, yeah, so we have indications that the notion is somehow natural and, and uh, yeah, can, can lead to useful uh, models. And um, there are a few things that we get for free. Um, I think, for instance, if you have these semi-graphoid properties, something that is well known in this graphical modeling community is that you can get a lot of things for free. For instance, if you look at directed graphical models, um, this shows, this is sufficient to show that the directed um, global uh, property is equivalent to the directed local property. So these are things that we get for free. And uh, finally, can we link? So we knew, know already that um, we recover the notion of angle current hits. Uh, can we do anything meaningful with the notion of, uh, of these max linear models? which was a bit our original motivation. Can we link the two approaches? And um, the answer is, well, partially at least. <laughs> so um, if you look at these structural um, uh, max linear models, um, they automatically define an exponent measure. It's easy to show that these are max infinitely divisible. So you get an exponent measure. Um, and so what we can show is that these are also um, uh, yeah, they also satisfy the directed local or the directed global um, uh, property with respect to uh, this measure, um, if, we, if we consider it. Um, okay, I think time's up. I don't want to keep you from lunch. Um, so we have this notion of condition independence that we think is quite natural for measures that explode at the origin. And um, homogeneity is not essential. And um, also existence of Lebesgue densities is not essential. And um, so 
there is a special role of the origin and um, it bridges a little bit these two worlds. Um, you can extend this also to, there are some nice results by Evgenis. He's linked this also to Levy processes, where it turns out that this leads to a relatively natural notion. And um, there's, yeah, we're desperately trying to write, get a preprint ready. <laughs> uh, thank you for your attention. I'm meeting with Jeff and the uh, Western during the conference on a video call, so <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>